Morgan is going through my photos on my phone. She's like, Daddy, why is there so many photos of you with the middle finger? <laughs> Welcome now to the Crank Revolution Podcast, your source for cycling shenanigans. Listen now to our hosts, the purveyors of pedals, as we teach you more about cycling every single episode. So sit right back, pop a cold one, and enjoy our show. It is winter time. Yes. Believe it or not, it is. And for those of you who are in the Midwest, you know what we're talking about. We actually are having record colds right now. Single digit What happened to fall? It kind of went well <laughs> sharply. <laughs> them, yeah. yeah, yeah. So what did we do lately, though? We had some fat bike fun today, didn't we? Yes, we did. So got out, what was it, yesterday? It was very cold and icy, and I slid around and fell a bunch of times riding my e-fat bike. That was kind of fun, though. So check that video out on Crank Revolution Media. However, Ooh. with these cold winter seasons coming, I think a lot of people think the bike season actually ends, but it doesn't end. There's a bike for every season bike for every season and there's a lot more than one bike for every season okay bike so for every season <laughs> thank Father, you can you hear me <laughs> how do you guys feel about that though uh what kind of do you actually bike in the snow mark i try to because i have a fat bike now great so i'm just fat on a bike that's perfect <laughs> well tc though he has actually two fat bikes you have a carbon them, yeah. fat bike and yeah. you have and an e-fat bike Ooh, and they don't make that very often. but you guys can get out there and we got the holidays coming up really quickly here so we wanted to take a moment to show appreciation hey everyone it's greg just want to say thank you for being part of our podcast thank you for visiting our shop and being a part of our group rides we love interacting with all of you in fact we want to interact with you a bit more you can find us on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, and Strava. Just look for Crank Revolution. And if you're a podcast listener, just look for Crank Revolution Media, and you'll find our podcast-specific page on Strava. Talk to you later. Thank you. Bye. To one of our very special hosts. So, Merck! <laughs> oh, it's not TC! Yay! It is all about Merck today. It is I a like Merck episode now. But we want to talk about Merck today. Merck has been a host now for, geez, 19 episodes. Holy cow. And he's also the only one from Crank Revolution HR who hasn't had a write-up yet. Well done, Merck. No, yeah. it's coming. Then why did your daughter sure. say every photo of you has the middle finger up? Just out of curiosity. <laughs> HR hasn't it's, seen that. It, it's how I greet everybody. It's, it's one of those things. We started to notice that you know more and more of you guys are listening to us, and we, we have to tell you how much we absolutely love that and adore you guys. It's time you learn some more about us. So Merck, yes. tell me something about you. I am the old man here. How old exactly are you? In dog years. In dog Yeah, in dog years. God, uh, that's multiplication. Or do you want to do goldfish years? The podcast takes off 20 years on The Voice, just so you know. Oh, it does? Oh, at least. What's the uh, conversion rate on uh, goldfish years there? <laughs> hey, Siri. <laughs> <laughs> We're not going to he Siri this one. Oh, so how do we so convert? Wait, wait, wait. What's the conversion? Double your no, age. No, be by 28. Yeah. So what are you in goldfish years then? So one year of goldfish would be 18 years of human. So then you're so very old. Your, I would be very old. You're like a Japanese koi. I wouldn't be a dragon yet. Koi is a different option on this calculator. But <laughs> Mark, take us way back to your childhood here. Where did you grow up? I grew up in the city of Wheaton. I'm sorry. Wheaton? Wheaton. The city of Wheaton. And <laughs> let's explore your childhood. And that's in Illinois. So was your childhood filled with bicycles? Absolutely it was. And coffee? Yeah, see, that's the problem. <laughs> the five-year-old barista. <laughs> Riding bikes, serving coffee through the neighborhood. But take us back. What was uh, your childhood like with bicycles? What role did they play? It got me out of my house and around the town. It helped me explore more. Really kind of developed my, my wonderlust. Adventure ah, spirit. My adventure wanderlust. spirit, my wonderlust. <clears throat> so what years are we looking at for that childhood exactly? When I rode the most was probably my teenage years. And that was in Bell Bottoms, I assume. Yeah, what was the soundtrack mm. to that to those years? Hair metal. A lot of hair, hair metal. metal. Yeah. Oh, How many didn't see that one coming? How many bell bottoms were destroyed in your bike as you were pedaling around? None town? because that was not part of my fashion sense. Oh, it was hot pants. A lot of lot of butt cheek hanging out. So listen <laughs> as to a it. cyclist, that must have been quite the look. <laughs> so with the hair metal, what Turned hair do you sporting? <laughs> Tell me you had a mullet. Did you have a mullet? <sighs> no, I didn't have a mullet. You were all party. I you? was Actually, I was all party. I was mushroom head. I shaved everything around except for the top of my head. So wait, so you had three bowl. stooges. Close. It was like the anti-monk uh, hairdo. So hot pants, a monk hairdo, and you were listening to hair metal. What was the bike of that time in those teenage years? That was actually a Lotus uh, Sport 
back in the teenage years. That was the bike that I really developed racing on. Prior to that, I do I have to call out because I did have a Schwinn fastback in oh. orange. Oh, that was fantastic. How old were you? Eight eight ish in that area. The the unfortunate yeah, I know it when you get to my <laughs> age, it starts blurring a little bit. Would, well, so when you were half a like, goldfish, here. it's it's it flickers like those old uh Film yeah, you strips. gotta smack the side of <laughs> yeah. it a little, see if the memory comes back. So, eight years old though. When did you learn to ride a bike? Uh, probably when I was four. Ah, uh, who taught you? My dad. Your uh, dad. It was fantastic. That that is a memory that I will never forget. Is him horse collaring me? <laughs> Wait, what? Running around horse collar? You, you know what horse collar? No, is. I don't. All right, so it's you're grabbing somebody by the collar, and it's almost like a chokehold. Mm -hmm. But that was that was the way my dad was able to hold me up, and we would just go in a circle. He would spin me around. And I think that's why I finally am like, I had to escape because I was getting choked. <laughs> like, <laughs> I got it. I got dizzy. it. <laughs> well, no, I think you're right, though. I remember the my childhood, too. Yeah, the my dad teaching me to ride a bike. Now, at the time, it was probably 84, 85. What year was it for you? That was probably 75 or 76. Well, I know that in my childhood, the bikes thing was huge. Like, everyone's seen the Goonies with the kids riding through the neighborhood. In the mid-70s, was it pretty much the same thing? It's the same thing. Yeah, exactly. It was the same thing. And Well, and I think the, the big thing with, with myself and you, since you were a little bit older, it really was because my parents didn't cart me around to everything. I If I wanted to do something, I had to go out and do it. One of my jobs was I caddied for like a month. On a bicycle? Well, I had to get to my <laughs> no. caddy job. Oh, there are no bicycle On caddies. a bicycle. That would be cool, There should though. be bicycle caddies. There should caddies. be bicycle That's worth caddies. at least an extra $2 <laughs> in tips. <laughs> On fat bikes. So it, in order for me to get there, I had to ride my bike there, which was on the other side of town. So I like to imagine that you were basically racing through town, drafting off vehicles. Like, what was it, breaking away? Was it, was your life basically breaking away at that point? Really close. It really, truly was. <laughs> what were the helmets like back then, exactly? Styrofoam. <laughs> like a paper cup? No, <laughs> Pretty styrofoam much. cup? Yeah, yeah it, was, it was a thicker paper cup. So You're how comfortable 100%. were they? They were not that bad because they had a lot of good foam in it. So it was, it was still very comfortable. So Read you were post banana helmet, like where you pull it open and it's leather and it just got. To I your was head? post that. Oh. Yes, I was post that. So did you ride a bicycle to high school? Was that the thing? Like all the kids had the Trans Ams pulling up, and you just kind of rolled up on your Lotus. I did. <laughs> nice. How did that work out for you? Pretty good. Oh yeah, it was fantastic. It was a great high school experience. <laughs> <laughs> you were the only kid pulling up in a Lotus, though. I mean, most kids would have. Probably love yeah. to have been. Yeah, it wasn't the same Lotus. Oh, <laughs> what, what are you going, Pretty Woman? There, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, I'm just thinking Lotus Sports Car. I'm like, that'd be sweet. So, what really inspired you though to stay into cycling? Because if you were cycling in high school and you were doing all that traveling around town, what got you really inspired to make a career out of it? Honestly, it was Greg LeMond, the Tour de France, deck in '85. Also, the '84 Olympics, watching the Americans just dominate everything was kind of the wow. I can actually do this as a career until I tried to race and went, wow, I might be faster than my friends, but holy crap, these people are faster than me. Yeah, you're always <laughs> faster in your head. That's the thing. You're exactly. Going around, you're, you're here an eye of the tiger and you're doing great. And then no, 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 no. People pass you. No, no, no. So what made you give it up though? Did you have an injury or? For racing, just because I knew I wasn't as fast as anybody else. And, and yes, I did throw in the towel. But the flip side of it is when I started tinkering on bikes, that's when I went, oh, I can do this. No, you can't. I became a mechanic. And that's my dad still kind of jokes to this day about that. He's like, it was the funniest degree you ever got was your bike mechanic degree. I'm like, yeah, look what I'm doing now, dad. <laughs> so how old were you when you started working on bikes though? I was probably 16, 17. Were you fixing all the neighborhood bikes or was it just pretty much your own? I was fixing the neighborhood bikes. Yeah. Does that make you a cool kid back then in nope. high school? If you <laughs> nope. Bikes nope. You don't even have to finish that question. Nope. <laughs> well, I was, thinking, I was thinking back to that Monty Python skit about the bike mechanic. Because there's the football. Man. Yeah. There's yeah. the football stars, the theater nope. stars, and then the guy who oh, fixes Oh, they were all bikes. supermen, but yes. Nope. 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 <laughs> but you left cycling for a few years, though, to become like a master barista? I left cycling for a few years to go to college, which was a bad move. When I was a master barista... I was back in the cycling again because it was just an easier way of getting around instead of driving my car. What did you go to college for, though? Marketing. <laughs> so you love bicycles. Marketing. You fix, and then you go to marketing. Yes, Mar marketing. Yeah, marketing. Yeah, uh, it, because I listened to advice from my older brother, which, God bless him, he's like, that's where, you know, you got to earn your money somehow. 
And now all oh. these years later, you're actually in media, which is a form of marketing. Marketing, exactly. You're finally marketing. using that college degree. <laughs> That useless college degree got me into retail management. <laughs> so you've been a barista, you've been a bike store manager, you've done quite a few things, and now you're doing the Crank Revolution podcast. Yep. So what is your favorite bike memory, though? We've all got something that we just look back with uh, nostalgia. What's yours? It, it kind of actually stems from that. It was, I learned how to ride on a two-wheel bike. It was the way I, I explored everything. It wasn't just in the neighborhood anymore. I was able to go into downtown Wheaton and hang out with my friends in downtown Wheaton. When I got older and had a girlfriend who lived in Naperville, I was able to ride to Naperville instead of trying to figure out how to get a car because I didn't have a car. Wait, what was Lycra like back then? You said it. It's Lycra. <laughs> well, no, I mean, was it super flamboyant colored or is it pretty much the well, same thing? Well, it doesn't change my, generations. My, um, my, my colors for my racing career was lime green and black. So yes, it was very flamboyant colors. How do those look with a sunburn? That's kind of a weird skin tone, <laughs> just green, black, and red. It was awesome. <laughs> so what's, what's next for your cycling future? What are some things you want to get into? I know you went track cycling with TC uh, a couple episodes Woo-hoo. ago. That's actually my next step because my endurance for long distance stuff like Mike Nichols is just not there. I really enjoy just sprinting and knowing I can get faster. I'm going to try and get in the track season. Next year. Oh, I'm going to race. I'm going to race. Yeah. And yeah. <laughs> Are you racing track next season? Yeah, it will be. And also, I have some bike packing trips that I have in the back of my head that I want to oh, do. You, what's do. your dream bike packing trip? Actually, up in Wisconsin on the fat bike and just being in the woods. Snow or no snow? No snow. No snow. We no can knock that but out over. I'm fat in. bikes or snow bikes? Yeah, but you know what? I'm older. <laughs> fat bikes are Go comfort. Full squish. <laughs> fat bikes are comfort bikes. Full suspension then. I know. I can't bring another bike in the house. <laughs> so what fat bike then? What fat bike? My fat bike is framed wolf track. Ah, where'd you get it? I got it from performance. <laughs> oh, performance bicycle. <laughs> Pour one out. Actually, the yeah. anniversary of them. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the anniversary recently. is coming up. It's the 13th is the anniversary of the announcement of wow. bankruptcy. We're in a much better place today. Yes, we are. Much <laughs> better. So if your dream bike packing trip is up Wisconsin. Yes, yes, it is. Up in Scanny. In Scanny. You've got that beautiful new specialized Roubaix, though. Where are you going to take it? Yeah. That is going to be a trip down to Peoria. I For have, the mountain biking? That You know what? We'll get back to that because... Actually, the mountain biking down there, There's, they yeah. are doing a fantastic job down there. No, I've seen some of the race footage. They've been uh, they've been doing it well. One of those dreams that I have, an odd dream, is to ride down to Peoria. That's where my in-laws are. About, uh, I think it's 150 miles the way that I would go. I kind of want to accomplish that in one day. And oh, well, you could do that. I could yeah, do that. Yeah. And then, you know, have the wife pick me up and drive me home. But <laughs> <laughs> Or she drives down with the mountain bike. Oh. Switch out the next day, go mountain bike. That's a good idea. Yeah. yeah. TCAR. Multiple always, bikes. You know, it, it, TC, <laughs> it's like, that sounds like a terrible idea. Okay, when uh, do we yeah, start? That's... So, besides like emulating breaking away with your backwards cap, cycling through the 70s on your Lotus Esprit or whatever it was. <laughs> it's um, not a Lotus Esprit, <laughs> that's an automobile. It's a, yeah. <laughs> it's a Lotus Sport. Yeah. The Lotus and it's Sport. And it's not the cool Lotus. That you saw Olympics, it's Boardman, not, not the Boardman, not the Boardman Lotus. Lotus. No, it wasn't the cool Lotus that Boardman. Yeah, because there's no. like four of those in the yeah, world. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> what about mountain biking? Were you there during the heyday of the wonderful emergence of mountain biking? I I was there during the heyday of mountain biking, and it was a really really cool scene, and I was very happy to get into that scene because mountain bikers were were a bunch of hippies. They were very fun. I did get into the mountain bike scene with the same exact road geometry of <laughs> my bike <laughs> with really short handlebars. I got to bring those in for you. I still have them. Like 580s? Yeah, something like that. <laughs> and I did race a little bit on mountain bikes. Not well, but I raced on mountain bikes. So was that in Illinois, though? Because there's not no, a lot of... Uh, totally lot Wisconsin. There. Wisconsin. Yeah, Wisconsin. The off-road series up in Wisconsin has been going on for... Years and years. Years and years. Decades. So what made you choose, though, to go back down to track cycling for racing instead of mountain biking? Track cycling is was always a passion for me, even back in the day, because I remember coming home from watching the Pan Am Games in Indianapolis back in 87. My brother was driving. He's like, ooh, what's this event going on? We pulled off to the side of the road. 
the major Taylor Velodrome is an open velodrome, just like Northbrook is, you're able to watch the event on the opposite side of the road without going in. And just, we watched the match sprint. Oh, it was just fantastic. And then looked at my body type, did some research on the body type. I'm like, <laughs> I fit that. <laughs> well, I was thinking about it, though. For track cycling, you need to get the one-piece skin suit. Maybe. Depends. Depends on what, what weight loss I get to the season. <laughs> I'll just take your beer. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> We've all seen or have that story where we made a mistake in the past. So what was one of those mistakes for you? <sighs> well, it was actually a chain issue. I had to quickly put a chain on my bike in order to get to one of my jobs back in the day. Slapped it on, thought I had it completely put on, got up to a stoplight, actually got out of the saddle to sprint because it was starting to turn, and there was no more chain. Did you, was did you fall and rack yourself on no, the top No, I tube? didn't. Oh. I actually didn't. A $5,000 bike turned into a push bike that day. <laughs> <laughs> so let's take a moment real quick, though, and cut over to TC, our resident mechanic, and talk a little bit about chains this week on From the Mechanics Month. Hey guys, TC here, and today's From the Mechanic's Mouth, we're going to talk about chains. And specifically within the chain, we're going to talk about master links. So master links are a specialty link that you'll find on most chains nowadays that are able to separate, be removed, remove the chain, and then reinstalled with minimal amount of tools. You don't need to push that chain pin all the way out to get that chain to be breakable. Now, you will see a lot of chains from Shimano about a couple of years ago, 8, 9, 10-speed chains all had replacement pins. A lot more work, push that pin out, and install a new pin. With a master link, you have two outer plates, each containing a pin, and they fit together to form one solid link across the chain. And when we're looking at a master link, each company does make their own specific chain and master link. So a SRAM chain with a SRAM master link, KMC chain with a KMC master link. I don't recommend replacing Shimano parts with SRAM parts to mix it up. And that's from the mechanic's mouth. It's the holiday season. In this holiday, you may not know what to get your cyclist. I've been a bad boy this year, so nothing for me. But Craig, what do you want for this Christmas? Oh, there are two things that would really make my Christmas. Either the specialized pizza rack to put on the front of my bike, or all of the bike packing or touring things I might do, or getting a set of WTB 700C Byway tires, because those things are so awesome. And you've been a good boy, Merck. What do you want this Christmas? I need tools. The Silka Hex set would be fantastic, and also the Park Tool three-way socket tool. And TC, what would you like for Christmas? I've wanted to get the Silka Super Pista Ultimate Floor Pump. That's $450 for so many years. So if you don't know what to get your cyclist, stop on by the Crank Revolution Bike Shop. This season, more riding bikes. And get a coffee while you're there. If we don't see you at the shop, have a wonderful holiday season. In our ever-continuing quest to bring you more about cycling, there is a type of bikes that we have not yet discussed. There's what are lot. they? There's a lot There's, of types of bikes yeah. we haven't discussed. Well, let's start with one today. Where do we want to go? Well, so one of our guys actually on the Crank Revolution group ride page shared a really fun video of a recumbent doing some off-roading and then a bar spin. So we should talk about Wait, describe this. Recumbent yeah, with a bar spin. Slow this spin. down. Bar spin. But to really slow it down, we need to talk about what recumbents are. Recumbents are recumbent bicycles. So you're actually laying down in a much more supported position. They come in a lot of different variations. Most commonly, the most common one, the most basic one that you'll see, are the long wheelbase recumbents. So they have a very long wheelbase. It's about twice the length of normal bikes. Yeah, you're in a very relaxed position, stacked right over the rear wheel, and your feet go out pretty low in front of you, and the handlebars are typically above, your, above the waist steering. Very long, pretty small wheels on those, usually about 20 inch. And that's the most basic, simplest kind of recumbent. Has anyone ever ridden one of those? I've tried. They're not easy. They're not easy to ride, but I've also tried to ride the one that doesn't have the steering wheel out in front. Oh, the it's below the, seat steering? It's the below seat steering. Yeah. Which, yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, things that always confuse me is I've seen a couple types of recumbents. So I have tried the one that you're describing, the <laughs> only two wheels. Well, yes, most yeah. pedal up above do. at the level of your heart. So you're kind of reaching up in the air mm -hmm. and you're at least a foot and a half, two feet off the ground. And so what you're describing there is actually a short wheelbase recumbent, typically like a racing recumbent with a high crank that cranks above the uh, front wheel. And the front wheel is usually 
They're like 650B or 650C specifically or 700C size wheels, much larger wheels than on the long wheelbase recumbents. And it's also worth saying that the crank is, could be in front of that wheel at the same time. Uh, yeah, it's typically in front and typically, yeah, about three feet off the ground. So your crumple zone is your crank. Yes, which <laughs> that being said, so I did work at a bike shop where we sold recumbents and there was one time when we would hang them in the ceiling and you would hang it by one hook over the rear wheel and then one hook over the in front of the crank and then you would pull it up and be done two pulleys up in the ceiling there was one time when one fell and swung and the crank landed stuck into the hardwood floor the, the, actually the table that was next to me <laughs> and i uh, that's some indiana jones just, level stuff right there bike crank just swinging down from the ceiling with the force of a recumbent bike did you suddenly just hear bum, ba, da, i went dum. home i just went home <laughs> just i was done that day bum, ba, da, bum. <laughs> yeah now that's kind of scary but i've seen a couple types now so help direct where my thinking is now i've seen the ones that have two wheels in the back and one in the front what are those called well, so that would be a recumbent trike but specifically it's called the tadpole and that would be a, and then we go tadpole recumbent trike Wait, we have a trike, but then I've seen the ones that have two wheels in front, one in the back. That would be a tadpole. And that's a delta. Delta, not a tadpole. Delta trike. So what really what TC has really educated us on is you can say recumbent bike, but you have to be very specific with the amount of well, variation. So there was a company that made a folding recumbent electronic delta trike. That thing had to have been made out of Legos and, or Kinects. And it was very German. Very over-engineered. Well, so if there's a couple different types, then would you say there's three types of basically recumbents or are there more? There's so many different kind of small minutia differences between how each brand produces their recumbent. For the like racing recumbents, the, the short wheelbase ones, Bechetta, Volley are some of the biggest names. And they do some that are just a carbon fiber tube straight from the crank down to the rear wheel and then a small fork coming out. And so each company, because of how differently they're doing it, some full off-road ones with suspension. There's oh, that so sounds much... wild. They make off-road recumbents? Yes. They make off-road recumbents. They make off-road recumbent quads, which are now four wheels. This recumbent, more relaxed size position on a bike, there's a lot of variation. So here. this is something new then? No. Yeah, it's been around for a while. Like 20 years? 40 60, yeah. 80, yeah, about, you know yeah, what? about 80 about, years. I wouldn't say 80. 100? Well, actually, hold on. Let's take a quick moment to look back at the history of the recumbent. When some cyclists roll up next to a recumbent or trike for the first time, they tend to think of it as a new bicycle invention. But this couldn't be farther from the truth. Developing alongside in the times of the safety bicycle and penny farthing. That recumbent you roll up next to today can trace its roots all the way back to the 1890s. Fast forwarding ahead to the 1930s, French inventor Charles Mache was having his bike of the future designs ratified by the UCI to show off the speed of his new bicycle. He would have his chance in July 1933 at the Paris Velodrome. His design beat out a 20-year-old record by Oscar Egg, attracting a lot of attention. Months later, in 1934, manufacturers of the upright bicycle lobbied to have the one-hour record declared invalid, prompting the UCI to create a new definition of the racing bicycle that effectively banned recumbents at UCI events. Now that we're in the future, though, something that I saw when we were at the local forest preserve, I got passed. I was doing probably 15, 16 by a guy on, I guess it would be a Delta recumbent, flying by with an e-bike. It was an e-bike recumbent. Well, so... E-bike recumbent trike is what you're saying. Yeah. So wow. you always want to, when you say, you want to say trike, identify that it has three wheels. But he was too. flying by. And the weirdest thing was, instead of like steering with a handlebar, he actually was steering with like two little joystick looking things. Well, yeah. Typically with a Delta trike, because you have two wheels right next to you, you'll be steering there and they, steering is often linked. I've seen one that wasn't. It was really awkward to steer each wheel individually. What? That sounds terrifying. Yeah. That's like watching a baby gazelle run for the first time. Yeah. Wait, no, 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 but when you're going downhill, you can do the, the pizza slice and yep. what's the other it's one? It's an extra skiing? braking yeah. surface. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Both wheels out wide. But tell us more then. So with steering, for example, I've seen so many variations. Uh, what are some of the ways that these things are actually done? Well, so the steering, I mean, it's really kind of discussed either above the rider or below the rider, above the waist, below the waist. And it's either way, it takes some getting used to. You know, if the, if the steering column is above you, climbing onto that bike raising this handlebar, bringing them back down. Kind of like you're getting onto a roller coaster. You got the <laughs> the kind of the uh, the safety bar comes latched yeah, on yeah, and yeah. Like latches you into the bike. But the big thing with recumbents and what takes the most kind of time is really fun when I was selling recumbents. Downtown Chicago. 
very busy streets and you're teaching someone how to ride a bike once again. And this is just a very different way to ride a bike. But to start riding on any recumbent, you start with a hobby horse technique. And so oh, describe that. I can't picture so that. So as we've talked in the history of the bicycle, one of the orig original things was the hobby horse, which you would just straddle and then kick along with both feet and get yourself going. So with the long wheelbase recumbents, it's not too big of a transition from kicking along the ground to putting your foot onto that low crank. Get actually your pedal. Oh, so you get started. a running start. Uh, yeah, but it's a awkward sitting in a chair kind of trying to run start. How do you do that to stop? Like cars are behind honk, and then you're trying to Fred Flintstone well, your so way to, to your bicycle. Once you get comfortable with these, preferably if you're clipped in, you'll keep one foot in, and you'll have your other foot down as your kickstand, and so you get a nice push with your pedal foot to get yourself going back. Oh, that again. makes sense. But yeah. the difference is with a hobby horse, you are in a very vertical position. Yeah. It's almost a natural running position to get yeah. started. In this case, though, you're literally just moving from your knee down, just trying yep. to shove yourself Oh, it's forward. like that awkwardness you've seen at every like office cubicle ever where somebody yeah, tries kick to kick him, across kick the room on their, on their office chair. chair. Yeah. Yeah, or yeah, exactly. That's exactly what it looks like. Or you drop the TV remote and you're on the couch, you refuse to move. So you're just trying to get your foot to bring it back over. It's <laughs> ineffective, but it's all you're willing to do. Now, do you find that easy for you, TC? I mean, I've done it enough. I've done 20 plus miles on a recumbent before. So it's, yeah, something I'm pretty, pretty okay with. But teaching people who probably haven't ridden a bike in a number of years, generally speaking, when I was teaching them how to ride a bike, it was, a, it was a trying time for a lot of folks. I think that's kind of the misconception that a lot of people have with recumbents is, oh, I'll get a recumbent because it's easier to ride. I mean, to sit down, because of how supported your position is, a lot of people, you know, you don't really have the same issues with saddle sores or saddle right. soreness because your whole seat back, you know, shoulders are supported. Some even have headrests. The headrest ones are really fun. <laughs> They're really comfy. That sounds comfy. And as far as some of the seat goes, it can be as little as like a cheap lawn chair where it's almost just a bunch of elastic bands on two metal poles. Yep. And that's what you're I, sitting on. Other I, times it could be a bucket seat. So, I mean, you really can go crazy and then the, with comfort. The well, high-end ones go to a full carbon, just kind of racing setup where it's this very form fit carbon saddle. Well, saddle. I, like a seat. Formula One yeah. Like a Formula yeah. One style kind of cutout. Yeah. Well, what's funny to me, though, is we talked last episode about how distracted bicyclists could be a thing as we add more and more electronics to sure. our handlebars. We are one step away with this recumbent you're describing. You're sitting, you've got a nice little neck brace, and you're in a recline, <laughs> like a recliner. You could just pop on the Bears game as you're sitting there cycling. Yeah, you get your iPad set up on the handlebars, yeah. You could swift along, actually, while actually riding a bike. It's like real life. Real Touring life. bikes, it's like let's real go. Life. <laughs> Maybe that's what it takes to get the kids out there. So hey kids, you want a Fortnite and ride? <laughs> so recumbent, though, the word encompasses a lot of different types of riding. It really does because you have your trikes, you have your two-wheel. Mm -hmm. Have you ridden most of those? I have ridden pretty much every style of recumbent or recumbent trike that you can manufacture. So if somebody hasn't really ridden a, a traditional bicycle, what would you start them on, a trike? And that's the trikes in a lot of ways kind of exist for folks that need them. Um, that's, that's the most common. So I've had people with, uh, vertigo, you know, inner ear kind of balance issues. And then a lot of folks who get to the recumbent world are, have severe shoulder, neck, back kind of pain that isn't conducive to traditional upright bikes. The recumbents really kind of fill that niche, recumbent trikes as well, and really kind of get people a nice, easy, supported position to get back to being active. So being that the fact that you're low on these bikes, you're, so you're not far off the ground, you're obviously using a smaller tire then sometimes sometimes no you know there's yeah generally speaking yeah a lot of them have are built around like a 20 inch tire platform but some of the racing ones are full 700c wheels wow um some of the trikes especially like the racing trikes um you'll have like a 700c wheel in the back but then two smaller wheels on the side because that's the driving wheel it's actually funny while we were doing our research for the episode we actually sat down and we found one that uses 29ers with four inch tires as a recumbent. <laughs> oh my God. A fat bike recumbent, and I'm just gonna say it, probably an e bike at the same time exists probably. out there. Mm -hmm. I think we played around with the uh, combinations that you can build. It came out to like $20,000 for yeah. this oh, thing. Yeah, yeah. And that's, yeah, generally speaking, recumbents are gonna be kind of more expensive than your traditional bike, in large part due to economies of scale. Uh, yes, I have an econ degree, so that's why I'm gonna talk about these things. Um, but yeah, just recumbent market is such a smaller market in the bicycle world. So there's so f so many fewer made and the cost to make that more complex, larger frame is quite a bit more. 
I think the the one thing that you miss is with the vertigo is that I do have one friend who has multiple hip injuries mm -hmm. and he finally had to go switch to a recumbent trike. Yeah. Because it's not that far of a fall if he actually bails on that bike. And it's I don't recumbent trike, it's hard to fall. Not that you can't. That, you were, correct. I've yeah. definitely got them on two wheels and it's way exciting. But that was uh that got yelled at. That there. was just you. <laughs> yeah. Was it well, against no, the it race just rules? Me. Uh no, we were well, my buddy and I were racing around the park and had a little too much fun. Well, so besides the different medical reasons someone can go to a recumbent, though, there are certain advantages, at least that I've seen. Greg and I were at uh, a local kickstand classic, and the guy that came in first place was flying along on a recumbent. It was a two-wheel, but the guy was a foot and a half off the ground. It was a complete like race-style recumbent. There's not a lot of airflow down there. Or what's going on with that? Yeah, the airflow down at less than two feet above the ground. He was sitting at knee level. Like I didn't well, even he know he sitting, was there. He was laid out. I mean, yeah, he's kind of laying down and pedaling in this very vertical motion. And that's one of the things about recumbents is because of that position that you're in where you're full back. Think about like a, you go to, the, go to the gym and you go to that leg press machine. You get that full support of your, your seat and your back and everything. You can really get really real strong push. And that's where a lot of times recumbents kind of find their find their power because um, you can sit down put a lot of power into the pedals and because you're in this more aerodynamic position you can go a lot faster yeah, so being that you're laying down though and the fact that you're not above your crank mm -hmm. where are you riding one of these are you going to be climbing all the hills or are you going to be doing this mostly on the flats or just soapbox derby downhill and so to my knowledge there's almost no like bicycling records that don't exist in a traditional bike and recumbent category recumbents have covered pvp Trans Am, Ram, all of these races have been done on recumbents, which are, yeah, very hilly. You can do it. You can always do it if you have the time. But you know what makes other cyclists salty? If you're in the same ride with a recumbent, you cannot draft a recumbent. Your legs get no. more aerodynamic, but nothing else. Yeah, you don't get any any draft, any pull off a recumbent riding a traditional bike. And recumbents don't hold the line as nicely as a traditional bike. Now, why is that exactly? Uh, I mean, the steering position and everything kind of you're more relaxed in and you're not as, you know, putting as much pressure on the front wheel as what I feel that it is. And you're not kind of stacked over that and really looking straight down at the line. You're looking up, you're looking forward. You're not sitting down, you know, riding the bike, staring at what you're pedaling on top of. With a recumbent, is that a good platform for touring? Absolutely. It's well supported. You've got a lot of frame space to add bags. And so, yeah, recumbent is actually perfectly viable for touring. I have met a number of touring cyclists who have used them for you know long haul tours because of the long frame design you've got a lot of yeah. space to add bags places to put bags because you're very supported position you're very comfortable to be riding for hours upon hours each day um, but yeah like the gearing is something that's a little bit different it's harder to climb you know on a recumbent because you can't get on top of the pedals you can't really force it down you always have to keep a pretty high pretty strong cadence that's what makes it a little bit different i'm trying to imagine if you're on a really steep hill with a recumbent and you're pedaling uphill so your feet are actually above your heart at that point mm -hmm. you're actually it's a, it's a very to get odd uphill. feeling it's very difficult so if someone's looking to buy a recumbent though what are some of the big brands here what are some things that we can recommend there's a lot of different brands there's a lot of companies that do kind of small batch recumbents uh, the most common ones that I've sold, Bachetta, Rans, Sun, Volet, and then in the trike world, Terra Trike and Cat Trike. Those are the most common ones. There's a lot of them. Because everybody's doing kind of pretty small, pretty low production runs, there's a lot of companies that, that start it, that try a few, and then maybe don't make it some, so long. We had a conversation one time about a very specific type of recumbent. It's like the soapbox derby world where you can do some crazy and amazing racing things. And that's kind of where my introduction to recumbents started was with the full fairings. It's encased completely. I mean, these guys are, are, are traveling at like 75 miles per hour. Yeah. Just simply down the road. Now, I want to interrupt you real quick. For everyone else who doesn't know what a fairing is, imagine you're out on your bike, you're walking your dog, and suddenly you see a Twinkie or an eggplant or a zucchini or something flying down the road two feet off the ground, and it's basically the, almost a teardrop shape of something made of fiberglass or carbon fiber. Yeah. yeah. That's yeah someone, you can't even see I, the rider in that. It's like a miniaturized Oscar Mayer wiener car, yeah. kind of. It's like a cigar box racer. It, it just goes flying. And Mark, take it away, my friend. It's fascinating to see the aerodynamic portion of it. Some of the funniest things I have witnessed is when they decided to make a criterium out of these bikes. A race? Wow. A race. Oh, yeah, this was 
back in maybe the early 80s. I'm imagining Road just, Rash or Mario Kart style. I would racing. go Mario Kart because you can't really get Road Rash when you're fully encased in something. That's True. fair. No, yeah. but you can't get back up, too. I've actually no, seen yeah. them <laughs> where they're riding, and if they tip it and spill it, it's like I've fallen turtle. and I can't get up. <laughs> just, somebody has to come out and try to lift them back up. The absolute turtle back. You just yeah, yeah. can't move. <laughs> So how does that actually work? Though they have races where they have they used to have races until they figured out it's like oh we can't turn well. <laughs> well, they no. do still have races, but they're more time. But trials. they're time trials, yeah. correct? They're like the Bonneville Salt Flats type of things. So you're just going as fast as you possibly can. Now there is a two categories in it. There's a single rider and a double rider. Tandems are really fascinating because they are back to back. They're not oh, riding weird. in a traditional. Feet forward, I guess, is the best way to describe it. Well, that's interesting because I read about tandem recumbents that exist. That is the captain. So the person in the front is traditional position where their feet are actually above the front wheel Mm -hmm. where they're pedaling. But the stoker, the person in the back, their legs are actually below the captain. So both riders mm -hmm. are in opposite positions for, I can't even imagine power wise what the difference would be. So 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 you have so instead of having a traditional tandem recumbent, they're riding back to back. The yes, I think one of the biggest things though, thinking about trying to own a recumbent, that's hard for me. I can fit my bike in the back of my car. Yep. How do you do that with a recumbent? Some of these are actually like the size of you half buy a, of a car. Yeah, like you a buy a van. I, I can. I have a Tahoe. Or you buy a van. They fit really nicely into vans. Into a van. Do they actually make racks for recumbents though? They, they do. They, yeah. They're very expensive. They're very hard to find. And you can hang them up four different ways off the back of your car. Yep. You could stack them on top of each other. And depending on which type of recumbent you have, sometimes you can't put it horizontally across the back of the car because it'll be too long. So in which case, then you have to put them vertically. I'm just thinking if you have a smart car or a Prius C, this is a hard thing. You might as well tow it in a U-Haul trailer. And that's one of the things about, about living with a recumbent. It can be difficult if you don't have the space. Because they're very long, because they're very kind of bulky things to work around, it's difficult to transport. I'm just sorry. I have this book in my head. Living with your new recumbent. <laughs> so, you've decided to, <laughs> so you've decided to ride a recumbent. <laughs> well, I'm trying to imagine, what do you do if you have a three-story walk up in Chicago? Good luck. Ah. <laughs> Lock it up outside really nice. Go outside your window with a pulley system and drop yeah. it down to the street. Big old pulley system. So it sounds like a recumbent is exactly the type of bike I would want if I have neck, shoulder, hip, or uh, vertigo issues. But what are some of the negatives behind riding one, experience-wise? They're low. They're low to the ground. Recumbents will almost always have some kind of flag, something to raise their visibility in the street uh, so that cars are more aware of their presence. Boy, can you get some cool flags for them, though? Yes, you can. There's a lot of options in flags. Well, I mean, if you think about it, though, your head is basically right above the bumper of a car or right below the bumper of a like a truck. Yeah, the positions here vary so much. You have some that are pretty high up, but you also, you also have some that are very, very low to the ground. So it's, yeah, flags are a really good indicator. So, hey, I'm here. Now, on a traditional road bike, though, you could, you're getting up out of the saddle, you're moving around, you're adjusting your grip. Does anything like that exist for a recumbent? Not really as much, but when you get out of the saddle, you're trying to derive a little bit more power. As TC said earlier, you can just push a little bit harder on those pedals and you can derive a lot of power out of there. Uh, So the fatigue out of your wrist are really gone from Mm -hmm. holding on to a traditional handlebar because it's either on your side or sitting in front of you. It's a much more relaxed position. But anyhow, guys, that has been a soft touch here on Recumbents from Crank Revolution. It's the holiday, guys. Get out there. Have a lot of fun. Any final thoughts, gents? Ride more bikes. Ride on. Stay visible. Thanks again for joining the Crank Revolution podcast. Oh, my friends, that has been another episode of the Crank Revolution podcast. First thing we'd like to say is thank you. Thanks for being our listeners and sharing the show with your friends. Leave us a rating or a review wherever you get your podcasts. We love the feedback. You can reach out to us by email at crankrevolutioncycling at gmail.com and find us on Facebook at Crank Revolution Media. 